Chapter 2 of Memoir of Jane Austen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Memoir of Jane Austen by James Edward Austen Lee. Chapter 2 Description of Steventon, Life at Steventon, Changes of Habits and Customs in the Last Century. As the first twenty five years, more than half of the brief life of Jane Austen were spent in the parsonage of Steventon, some description of that place ought to be given. Steventon is a small rural village upon the chalk hills of North Haunts, situated in a winding valley about seven miles from Basingstoke. The southwestern railway crosses it by a short embankment, and, as it curves round, presents a good view of it on the left hand to those who are travelling down the line, about three miles before entering the tunnel under Popham Beacon. It may be known to some sportsmen as lying in one of the best portions of the vine hunt. It is certainly not a picturesque country. It presents no grand or extensive views, but the features are small rather than plain. The surface continually swells and sinks, but the hills are not bold nor the valleys deep, and though it is sufficiently well clothed with woods and hedgerows, yet the poverty of the soil in most places prevents the timber from attaining a large size. Still, it has its beauties. The lanes wind along in a natural curve, continually fringed with the regular borders of native turf, and lead to pleasant nooks and corners. One who knew and loved it well very happily expressed its quiet charms when he wrote, True taste is not fastidious, nor rejects, because they may not come within the rule of composition pure and picturesque, unnumbered simple scenes which fill the leaves of nature's sketchbook. Of this somewhat tame country, Steventon, from the fall of the ground and the abundance of its timber, is certainly one of the prettiest spots. Yet one cannot be surprised when Jane's mother, a little before her marriage, was shown the scenery of her future home, she should have thought it unattractive, compared with the broad river, the rich valley, and the noble hills which she had been accustomed to behold at her native home near Henley-upon-Thames. The house itself stood in a shallow valley surrounded by sloping meadows, well sprinkled with elm trees at the end of a small village of cottages, each well provided with a garden, scattered about prettily on either side of the road. It was sufficiently commodious to hold pupils in addition to a growing family, and was in those times considered to be above the average of parsonages, but the rooms were furnished with less elegance than would now be found in the most ordinary dwellings. No cornice marked the junction of wall and ceiling, while the beams which supported the upper floors projected into the rooms below in all their naked simplicity, covered only by a coat of paint or whitewash. Accordingly, it has since been considered unworthy of being the rectory house of a family living, and about forty-five years ago it was pulled down for the purpose of erecting a new house in a far better situation on the opposite side of the valley. North of the house, the road from Dean to Popham Lane ran at a sufficient distance from the front to allow a carriage drive through turf and trees. On the south side, the ground rose gently, and was occupied by one of those old-fashioned gardens in which vegetables and flowers are combined flanked and protected on the east by one of the thatched mud walls common in that country, and overshadowed by fine elms. Along the upper or southern side of this garden ran a terrace of the finest turf, which must have been in the writer's thoughts when she described Catherine Morland's childish delight in rolling down the green slope at the back of her house. But the chief beauty of Steventon consisted in its hedgerows. A hedgerow in that country does not mean a thin formal line of quickset, but an irregular border of copsewood and timber often wide enough to contain within it a winding footpath or a rough cart track. Under its shelter the earliest primroses, anemones, and wild hyacinths were to be found, sometimes the first bird's nest, and, now and then, the unwelcome adder. Two such hedgerows radiated, as it were, from the parsonage garden. One, a continuation of the turf terrace, proceeded westward, forming the southern boundary of the home meadows, and was formed into a rustic shrubbery with occasional seats entitled the Wood Walk. The other ran straight up the hill under the name of the Church Walk, because it led to the parish church, as well as to a fine old manor house of Henry the Eighth's time, occupied by a family named Digweed, who have for more than a century rented it, together with a chief farm in the parish. The church itself, I speak of it as it then was, before the improvements made by the present rector, a spireless fane just seen above the woody lane, might have appeared mean and uninteresting to an ordinary observer, but the adept in church architecture would have known that it must have stood there some seven centuries, and would have found beauty in the very narrow early English windows, as well as in the general proportions of its little chancel, 
while its solitary position, far from the hum of the village and within sight of no habitation except a glimpse of the grey manor-house through its circling screen of sycamores, has in it something solemn and appropriate to the last resting-place of the silent dead. Sweet violets, both purple and white, grow in abundance beneath its south wall. One may imagine for how many centuries the ancestors of those little flowers have occupied that undisturbed sunny nook, and may think how few living families can boast of as ancient a tenure of their land. Large elms protrude their rough branches, old hawthorns shed their annual blossoms over the graves, and the hollow yew tree must be at least coeval with the church. But whatever may be the beauties or defects of the surrounding scenery, this was the residence of Jane Austen for twenty-five years. This was the cradle of her genius. These were the first objects which inspired her young heart with the sense of the beauties of nature. In strolls along those wood walks, thick coming fancies rose in her mind, and gradually assumed the forms in which they came forth to the world. In that simple church she brought them all into subjection to the piety which ruled her in life and supported her in death. The home at Steventon must have been, for many years, a pleasant and prosperous one. The family was unbroken by death and seldom visited by sorrow. Their situation had some peculiar advantages beyond those of ordinary rectories. Steventon was a family living. Mr. Knight, the patron, was also a proprietor of nearly the whole parish. He never resided there, and consequently the rector and his children came to be regarded in the neighborhood as kind of representatives of the family. They shared with the principal tenant the command of an excellent manor, and enjoyed, in this reflected way, some of the consideration usually awarded to landed proprietors. They were not rich, but, aided by Mr. Austin's power of teaching, they had enough to afford a good education to their sons and daughters, to mix in the best society of the neighborhood, and to exercise a liberal hospitality to their own relations and friends. A carriage and a pair of horses were kept. This might imply a higher style of living in our days than it did in theirs. There were then no assessed taxes. The carriage once bought entailed little further expense, and the horses probably, like Mr. Bennett's, were often employed on farm work. Moreover, it should be remembered that a pair of horses in those days were almost necessary if ladies were to move about at all, for neither the condition of the roads nor the style of carriage building admitted of any comfortable vehicle being drawn by a single horse. When one looks at the few specimens still remaining of coach building in the last century, it strikes one that the chief object of the builders must have been to combine the greatest possible weight with the least possible amount of accommodation. The family lived in close intimacy with two cousins, Edward and Jane Cooper, the children of Mrs. Austin's eldest sister, and Dr. Cooper, the vicar of Sunning near Reading. The Coopers lived for some years at Bath, which seems to have been much frequented in those days by clergymen retiring from work. I believe that Cassandra and Jane sometimes visited them there, and that Jane thus acquired the intimate knowledge of the topography and customs of Bath which enabled her to write Northanger Abbey long before she resided there herself. After the death of their own parents, the two young Coopers paid long visits at Steventon. Edward Cooper did not live undistinguished. When an undergraduate at Oxford, he gained the prize for Latin hexameters on Hortus Anglicus in 1791, and in later life he was known by a work on prophecy called The Crisis and other religious publications especially for several volumes of sermons, much preached in many pulpits in my youth. Jane Cooper was married from her uncle's house at Steventon to Captain, afterwards Sir, Thomas Williams, under whom Charles Austin served in several ships. She was a dear friend of her namesake, but was fated to become a cause of great sorrow to her, for a few years after the marriage she was suddenly killed by an accident to her carriage. There was another cousin closely associated with them at Steventon, who must have introduced greater variety into the family circle. This was the daughter of Mr. Austin's only sister, Mrs. Hancock. This cousin had been educated in Paris and married to a Count de Foyade, of whom I know little more than that he perished by the guillotine during the French Revolution. Perhaps his chief offense was his rank but it was said that the charge of incivism under which he suffered rested on the fact of his having laid down some arable land into pasture, a sign of his intention to embarrass the Republican government by producing a famine. His wife escaped through the dangers and difficulties to England, was received for some time into her uncle's family, 
and finally married her cousin Henry Austin. During the short peace of Amiens, she and her second husband went to France, in the hope of recovering some of the Count's property, and there narrowly escaped being included amongst the détenus. Orders had been given by Bonaparte's government to detain all English travelers, but at the post houses Mrs. Henry Austin gave the necessary orders herself, and her French was so perfect that she passed everywhere for a native, and her husband escaped under this protection. She was a clever woman and highly accomplished after the French rather than the English mode, and in those days when intercourse with the continent was long interrupted by a war, such an element in the society of a country parsonage must have been a rare acquisition. The sisters may have been more indebted to this cousin than to Mrs. La Tournelle's teaching for the considerable knowledge of French which they possessed. She also took the principal parts in the private theatricals in which the family several times indulged, having their summer theatre in the barn and their winter one within the narrow limits of the dining room, where the number of the audience must have been very limited. On these occasions, the prologues and epilogues were written by Jane's eldest brother, and some of them are very vigorous and amusing. Jane was only twelve years old at the time of the earliest of these representations, and not more than fifteen when the last took place. She was, however, an early observer, and it may be reasonably supposed that some of the incidents and feelings which are so vividly painted in the Mansfield Park theatricals are due to her recollections of these entertainments. Some time before they left Steventon, one great affliction came upon the family. Cassandra was engaged to be married to a young clergyman. He had not sufficient private fortune to permit an immediate union, but the engagement was not likely to be a hopeless or a protracted one, for he had the prospect of an early preferment from a nobleman with whom he was connected both by birth and by personal friendship. He accompanied this friend to the West Indies, as chaplain to his regiment, and there died of yellow fever, to the great concern of his friend and patron, who afterwards declared that, if he had known of the engagement, he would not have permitted him to go out to such a climate. This little domestic tragedy caused great and lasting grief to the principal sufferer, and could not but cast a gloom over the whole party. The sympathy of Jane was probably from her age, and her peculiar attachment to her sister, the deepest of all. Of Jane herself, I know of no such definite tale of love to relate. Her reviewer in the quarterly of January 1821 observes, concerning the attachment of Fanny Price to Edmund Bertram, the silence in which this passion is cherished, the slender hopes and enjoyments by which it is fed, the restlessness and jealousy with which it fills a mind naturally active, contented, and unsuspicious, the manner in which it tinges every event and every reflection, are painted with a vividness and a detail of which we can scarcely conceive any one but a female, and we should almost add, a female writing from recollection capable. This conjecture, however probable, was wide of the mark. The picture was drawn from the intuitive perceptions of genius, not from personal experience. In no circumstance of her life was there any similarity between herself and her heroine in Mansfield Park. She did not, indeed, pass through life without being the subject of warm affection. In her youth she had declined the addresses of a gentleman who had the recommendations of good character and connections and position of life, of everything, in fact, except the subtle power of touching her heart. There is, however, one passage of romance in her history with which I am imperfectly acquainted, and to which I am unable to assign name, or date, or place, though I have it on sufficient authority. Many years after her death, some circumstances induced her sister Cassandra to break through her habitual reticence, and to speak of it. She said that, while staying at some seaside place, they became acquainted with a gentleman, whose charm of person, mind, and manners was such that Cassandra thought him worthy to possess and likely to win her sister's love, when they parted. He expressed his intention of soon seeing them again, and Cassandra felt no doubt as to his motives. But they never again met. Within a short time they heard of his sudden death. I believe that, if Jane ever loved, it was this unnamed gentleman. But the acquaintance had been short, and I am unable to say whether her feelings were such of a nature as to affect her happiness. Any description that I might attempt of the family life at Steventon, which closed soon after I was born, could be little better than a fancy piece. There is no doubt that if we could look into the households of the clergy and the small gentry of that period, we should see some things which would seem strange to us, 
and should miss many more to which we are accustomed. Every hundred years, and especially a century like the last, marked by an extraordinary advance in wealth, luxury, and refinement of taste, as well as in the mechanical arts which embellish our houses, must produce a great change in their aspect. These changes are always at work. They are going on now, but so silently that we take no note of them. Men soon forget the small objects which they leave behind them as they drift down the stream of life. As Pope says, nor does life's stream for observation stay. It hurries all too fast to mark their way. Important inventions, such as the applications of steam, gas, and electricity, may find their places in history, but not so the alterations, great as they may be, which have taken place in the appearance of our dining and drawing rooms. Who can now record the degrees by which the custom prevalent in my youth of asking each other to take wine together at dinner became obsolete? Who will be able to fix, twenty years hence, the date when our dinners began to be carved and handed round by servants, instead of smoking before our eyes and noses on the table? To record such little manners would indeed be to chronicle small beer. But in a slight memoir like this, I may be allowed to note some of those changes in social habits which give a color to history, but which the historian has the greatest difficulty in recovering. At that time, the dinner-table presented a far less splendid appearance than it does now. It was appropriated to solid food, rather than to flowers, fruits, and decorations. Nor was there much glitter of plate upon it, for the early dinner-hour rendered candlesticks unnecessary, and silver forks had not come into general use, while the broad rounded end of the knives indicated the substitute generally used instead of them. The dinners, too, were more homely, though not less plentiful and savoury and the bill of fare in one house would not be so like that in another as it is now, for family receipts were held in high estimation. A grandmother of culinary talent could bequeath to her descendant fame for some particular dish, and might influence the family dinner for many generations. Dos est magna parentium virtus. One house would pride itself on its ham, another on its game pie, and a third on its superior firmity, or tansy pudding. Beer and homemade wines, especially mead, were more largely consumed. Vegetables were less plentiful and less various. Potatoes were used, but not so abundantly as now, and there was an idea that they were to be eaten only with roast meat. There were novelties to a tenant's wife who was entertained at Steventon Parsonage, certainly less than a hundred years ago, and when Mrs. Austin advised her to plant them in her own garden, she replied, no, no, they are very well for you gentry, but they must be terribly costly to rear. But a still greater difference would be found in the furniture of the rooms, which would appear to us lamentably scanty. There was a general deficiency of carpeting in sitting rooms, bedrooms, and passages. A pianoforte, or rather, a spinet or hopsichord, was by no means a necessary appendage. It was to be found only where there was a decided taste for music not so common then as now, or in such great houses as would probably contain a billiard-table. There would often be but one sofa in the house, and that a stiff, angular, uncomfortable article. There were no deep easy-chairs, nor other appliances for lounging, for to lie down or even to lean back was a luxury permitted only to old persons or invalids. It was said of a nobleman, a personal friend of George the Third, and a model gentleman of his day, that he would have made the tour of Europe without ever touching the back of his travelling carriage. But perhaps we should be most struck with the total absence of those elegant little articles which now embellish and encumber our drawing-room tables. We should miss the sliding bookcases and picture-stands, the letter-weighing machines and envelope-cases, the periodicals and illustrated newspapers. Above all, the countless swarm of photograph books which now threaten to swallow up all that space, a small writing desk, with a smaller work box or netting case, was all that each young lady contributed to occupy the table, for the large family work basket, though often produced in the parlor, lived in the closet. There must have been more dancing throughout the country in those days than there is now, and it seems to have sprung up more spontaneously, as if it were a natural production with less fastidiousness as to the quality of music, lights, and floor. Many country towns had a monthly ball throughout the winter, in some of which the same apartment served for dancing and tea-room. 
Dinner parties more frequently ended with an extempore dancing on the carpet, to the music of a harpsichord in the house or a fiddle from the village. This was always supposed to be for the entertainment of the young people, but many who had little pretension to youth were very ready to join in. There can be no doubt that Jane herself enjoyed dancing, for she attributes this taste to her favorite heroines. In most of her works, a ball or a private dance is mentioned, and made of importance. Many things connected with the ballrooms of those days have now passed into oblivion. The barbarous law which confined the lady to one partner throughout the evening must indeed have been abolished before Jane went to balls. It must be observed, however, that this custom was in one respect advantageous to the gentleman, inasmuch as it rendered his duties more practicable. He was bound to call upon his partner the next morning, and it must have been convenient to have only one lady for whom he was obliged, to gallop all the country over, the last night's partner to behold, and humbly hope she caught no cold. But the stately minuet still reigned supreme, and every regular ball commenced with it. It was a slow and solemn movement, expressive of grace and dignity rather than of merriment. It abounded in formal bows and curtsies, with measured paces, forwards, backwards, and sideways, and many complicated gyrations. It was executed by one lady and gentleman, amidst the admiration or the criticism of surrounding spectators. In its early and most palmy days, as when Sir Charles and Lady Grandison delighted the company by dancing it at their own wedding, the gentleman wore a dress sword, and the lady was armed with a fan of nearly equal dimensions. Addison observes that women are armed with fans, as men with swords, and sometimes do more execution with them. The graceful carriage of each weapon was considered the test of high breeding. The clownish man was in danger of being tripped up by his sword getting between his legs. The fan held clumsily looked more of a burden than an ornament, while in the hands of an adept it could be made to speak a language of its own. It was not everyone who felt qualified to make this public exhibition, and I have been told that those ladies who intended to dance minuets used to distinguish themselves from others by wearing a particular kind of lappet on their headdress. I have heard also of another curious proof of the respect in which this dance was held. Gloves immaculately clean were considered requisite for its due performance, while gloves a little soiled were thought good enough for a country dance, and accordingly some prudent ladies provided themselves with two pairs for their several purposes. The minuet expired with the last century, but long after it had ceased to be danced publicly, it was taught to boys and girls in order to give them a graceful carriage. Hornpipes, cotillions, and reels were occasionally danced, but the chief occupation of the evening was the interminable country dance, in which all could join. This dance presented a great show of enjoyment, but it was not without its peculiar troubles. The ladies and gentlemen were ranged apart from each other in opposite rows so that the facilities for flirtation, or interesting intercourse, were not so great as might have been desired by both parties. Much heart-burning and discontent sometimes arose as to who should stand above whom, and especially as to who was entitled to the high privilege of calling and leading off the first dance, and no little indignation was felt at the lower end of the room when any of the leading couples retired prematurely from their duties, and did not condescend to dance up and down the whole set. We may rejoice that these causes of irritation no longer exist, and that if such feelings as jealousy, rivalry, and discontent ever touch celestial bosoms in the modern ballroom, they must arise from different and more recondit sources. I am tempted to add a little about the difference of personal habits. It may be asserted as a general truth that less was left to the charge and discretion of servants, and more was done, or superintended, by the masters and mistresses. With regard to the mistresses, it is, I believe, generally understood that at the time to which I refer, a hundred years ago, they took a personal part in the higher branches of cookery, as well as in the concoction of homemade wines, and distilling of herbs for domestic medicines, which are nearly allied to the same art. Ladies did not disdain to spin the thread of which the household linen was woven. Some ladies liked to wash with their own hands their choice china after breakfast or tea. In one of my earliest child's books, a little girl, the daughter of a gentleman, was taught by her mother to make her own bed before leaving her chamber. It was not so much that they had not servants to do all these things for them, as that they took an interest in such occupations. And it must be borne in mind how many sources of interest enjoyed by this generation were then closed, 
or very scantily open to ladies. A very small minority of them cared much for literature or science. Music was not very common, and drawing was still rarer accomplishment. Needlework in some other form or other was their chief sedentary employment. But I doubt whether the rising generation are equally aware how much gentlemen also did for themselves in those times, and whether some things that I can mention will not be a surprise for them. Two homely proverbs were held in high estimation in my earliest days than they are now. The master's eye makes the horse fat, and, if you would be well served, serve yourself. Some gentlemen took pleasure in being their own gardeners, performing all the scientific and some of the manual work themselves. Well-dressed young men of my acquaintance, who had their coat from a London tailor, would always brush their evening suit themselves, rather than entrust it to the carelessness of a roughed servant, and to the risks of dirt and grease in the kitchen. For in those days servants' halls were not common in the houses of the clergy and the smaller country gentry. It was quite natural that Catherine Morland should have contrasted the magnificence of the offices at Northanger Abbey with the few shapeless pantries in her father's parsonage. A young man who expected to have his things packed or unpacked for him by a servant when he travelled would have been thought exceptionally fine, or exceptionally lazy. When my uncle undertook to teach me to shoot, his first lesson was how to clean my gun. It was thought meritorious on the evening of a hunting day to turn out after dinner, lanthorn in hand, and visit the stable, to ascertain that the horse had been well cared for. This was of the more importance because, previous to the introduction of clipping about the year 1820, it was a difficult and tedious work to make a long-coated hunter dry and comfortable, and was often very imperfectly done. Of course, such things were not practiced by those who had gamekeepers, and stud grooms, and plenty of well-trained servants, but they were practiced by many who were unequivocally gentlemen, and whose grandsons, occupying the same position in life, may perhaps be astonished at being told that such things were. I have drawn pictures for which my own experience, or what I heard from others in my youth, have supplied the materials. Of course, they cannot be universally applicable. Such details varied in various circles and were changed very gradually. Nor can I pretend to tell how much of what I have said is descriptive of the family life at Steventon in Jane Austen's youth. I am sure that the ladies there had nothing to do with the mysteries of the stew-pot or the preserving pan. But it is probable that their way of life differed a little from ours, and would have been appeared to us more homely. It may be that useful articles, which would not now be produced in drawing-rooms, were hemmed and marked, and darned in the old-fashioned parlour. But all of this concerned only the outer life. There was as much cultivation and refinement of mind as now, with probably more studied courtesy and ceremony of manner to visitors, whilst certainly in that family literary pursuits were not neglected. I remember to have heard of only two little things different from modern customs. One was that on hunting mornings the young men usually took to their hasty breakfast in the kitchen. The early hour at which hounds then met may account for this, and probably the custom began if it did not end when they were boys, for they hunted at an early age, in a scrambling sort of way, upon any pony or donkey that they could procure, or in default of such luxuries, on foot. I have been told that Sir Francis Austin, when seven years old, bought on his own account, and must be supposed with his father's permission, a pony for a guinea and a half, and after riding him with great success for two seasons, sold him for a guinea more. One may wonder how the child could have so much money, and how the animal could have been obtained for so little. The same authority informs me that his first cloth suit was made from a scarlet habit, which, according to the fashion of the times, had been his mother's usual morning dress. If all this is true, the future admiral of the British fleet must have cut a conspicuous figure in the hunting field. The other peculiarity was that, when the roads were dirty, the sisters took long walk in pattens. This defiance against wet and dirt is now seldom seen. The few that remain are banished from good society and employed only in menial work. But a hundred and fifty years ago they were celebrated in poetry, and considered so clever a contrivance that Gay, and his trivia, ascribes the invention to a god stimulated by his passion for a mortal damsel, and derives the name Patton from Patty. The Patton now supports each frugal dame, which from the blue-eyed Patty takes the name. But mortal damsels have long ago discarded the clumsy implement. First, it dropped its iron ring and became a clog. Afterwards, it was fined down into the pliant galosh, lighter to wear and more effectual to protect. 
A no less manifest instance of gradual improvement than Cowper indicates when he traces through 80 lines of poetry his accomplished sofa back to the original three-legged stool. As an illustration of the purposes which a pattern was intended to serve, I add the following epigram, written by Jane Austen's uncle, Mr. Lee Perrault, on reading in a newspaper the marriage of Captain Foote to Miss Patton. Through the rough paths of life, with a pattern in your guard, may you safely and pleasantly jog. May the knot never slip, nor the ring press too hard, nor the foot find the pattern a clog. At the time when Jane Austen lived at Steventon, a work was carried on in the neighboring cottages which ought to be recorded, because it has long ceased to exist. Up to the beginning of the present century, poor women found profitable employment in spinning flax or wool. This was a better occupation for them than straw plating, inasmuch as it was carried out at the family hearth, and did not admit of gadding and gossiping about the village. The implement used was the long, narrow machine of wood, raised on legs, furnished at one end with a large wheel, and at the other with a spindle on which the flax or wool was loosely wrapped, connected together by a loop of string. One hand turned the wheel, while the other formed the thread. The outstretched arms, the advanced foot, the sway of the whole figure backwards and forwards, produced picturesque attitudes and displayed whatever of grace or beauty the workwoman might possess. Some ladies were fond of spinning, but they worked in quieter manner, sitting at a neat little machine of varnished wood, like turnbridge ware, generally turned by the foot with a basin of water at hand to supply the moisture required for forming the thread which the cottager took by a more direct and natural process from her own mouth. I remember two such elegant little wheels in our own family. It may be observed that this hand-spinning is the most primitive of female accomplishments, and can be traced back to the earliest times. Ballad poetry and fairy tales are full of allusions to it. The term spinster still testifies to its having been the ordinary enjoyment of the English young woman. It was the labor assigned to the ejected nuns by the rough earl who said, Go spin, ye jades, go spin. It was the enjoyment at which Roman matrons and Grecian princesses presided amongst their handmaids. Heathen mythology celebrated it in the three fates spinning and measuring out the thread of human life. Holy Scripture honors it in those wise-hearted women who did spin with their hands and brought that which they had spun for the construction of the tabernacle in the wilderness, and an old English proverb carries it still farther back to the time when Adam delved in Eve's span, but at last, this time-honored domestic manufacture is quite extinct amongst us, crushed by the power of steam, overborne by a countless host of spinning jennies, and I can only just remember some of its last struggles for the existence in the Steventon cottages. End of chapter 2